This morning, our scripture comes from uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel um, 3, uh, 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under Eli. The Lord's word was rare at that time, and visions weren't widely known. One day Eli, whose eyes had grown so weak he was unable to see, was lying down in his room. God's lamp hadn't gone out yet, and Samuel was lying in the Lord's temple where God's chest was. The Lord called to Samuel, I am here, he said. Samuel hurried to Eli and said, I am here, you called me. I didn't call you, Eli replied, go lie down. So he did. Again the Lord called Samuel. So Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, I'm here, you called me. I didn't call you, my son, Eli replied, go and lie down. Now Samuel didn't yet know the Lord, and the Lord's word hadn't yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. He got up and went to Eli and said, I'm here, you called me. Then Eli realized that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down where he'd been. Then the Lord came and stood there, calling just as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, speak, your servant is listening. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I really enjoy that we give each young person their own Bible. At the point at which they are learning to read and get into chapter books, then by golly, we give them the very best chapter book there is. And it raises questions for us about, is there any age where you are too young to be able to listen for the word and call of God? And our answer to that is, no, not really. Some might also wonder, is there any age after which you are no longer responsible for listening and responding to the word and call of God? Today's story suggests that no, there's not really one of those ages either. And how do you know when a message is from God? Well, there are many stories in the Bible that can help us understand that, and this one immediately came to mind. It's a familiar story. Samuel, who is quite young, and we don't really know exactly how young. His mother had brought him to the temple in, in, uh, with gratitude for God having given her that child, she said, I'm going to give him back to God. And as soon as he was weaned, which in that time probably would have been somewhere around three or four, she took him to the temple. And then every year she'd send a fresh set of uh, temple clothes for him. And, and, and if we were reading chapters one and two, we'd have heard several times that he was growing, that he was growing in uh, wisdom and in knowledge, and he was continuing to grow. So he might have been the third grader's age. Now, he might have been as old as the young person who brought in the light this morning, but he was still quite young. He hadn't gotten accustomed to hearing from God. It says that, that he did not yet know the word. Eli, on the other hand, was old enough he did not see well, really didn't expect to hear, because it says that the, the, word, the visions were not common. So, Samuel goes to bed one night. Now, I do not know what the full-time live in the temple acolytes did all that time, but he did sleep in the place where the ark of God was. And sometime in the night, he heard a noise, a voice, something that called to him, and he assumed that it was Eli. So he got up, woke Eli up, I, I'm here, you called. And like many parental figures, Eli's word was, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And he did. 
And then something happened again that got his attention, and he went and stood by Eli again. You called. I'm here. I did not call you. Go back to bed. And he did. And then it happened again. And by this time, Eli, even though he wasn't necessarily expecting to hear from God, recognized that this was no ordinary waking up in the middle of the night and suggested to Samuel, it's probably God. So if it happens again, when it happens again, speak to the voice, address it. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So armed with that new piece of wisdom, Samuel went back to bed, Eli probably went back to sleep, but Samuel was awakened for the fourth time. And that fourth time, he did not go to Eli. Instead, he responded to that voice and said, Speak, Lord. I'm listening. Your servant is listening. Our reading for today ends at that point. If we continued it, we would hear that he received a message that was going to be a very painful one for Eli. But for which Eli was also somewhat prepared because he'd already had someone else come to him and say, things for your family's role in leadership are coming to an end. So that when the child brought to him that confirmation of what God said, Eli acknowledged, yes, that is a message from God, even though it was an uncomfortable one for him. And I think that there are some pieces in this that give us some clues about how to tell if it's God communicating. I mean, that's really often the critical question. And in the children's Bible, they have a little paragraph about what does it mean that God's lamp hadn't gone out, which is that the oil lamp that burned all night was still burning, which means it was still night. Little paragraph on that. Then a big chunk, almost half a page, Is that you, God, giving some guidance on how to understand if it is God speaking? So that sense of repetition is one of the clues. God gets our attention, but not always with such um, flamboyance that we go, oh, well, of course that's God and immediately jump to it. Instead, it seems that sometimes God gets our attention, but allows us, requires us, to focus and say, God, if that's you, I'm listening. The repetition was certainly a clue. And it took a partnership to make sense out of the message. Samuel heard it. But part of that message was he was to go and share it with someone else. And when Eli heard it, he was able to confirm, yes, that is God. When I talked a month or so ago and shared with you the reflection and discernment process about moving into retirement next spring, I I had a very clear sense while I was on renewal leave of two different messages but companion messages. One was that after 35 years of ordination, it would be okay to retire. But no real sense of the timing on that, which is sort of an odd thing to get the sense of permission, but not a when attached to it. But then in beginning to pray the Lord, what do you want to do through me question, the prayer that is a part of our forward faithfully process, I had also a very clear sense of Stay through the capital campaign. Don't leave that for a newcomer. You helped start uh, or, or focus some of the processes that were already in motion. So stay through some of the completion of that. And someone asked me after that, so how do you know if it's from God? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a very good question. And I find that the same qualities in this passage from Samuel are ones that I use when I'm trying to sort through. And one of the sense is the sense of repetition. And over the years, I have often found that God used dreams as a way of getting my attention. 
And the first couple of weeks of renewal leave, I literally, literally, because I wrote them down, had a dozen dreams, and they alternated between packing and sorting, uh, packing and sorting unending uh, sets of stuff, and church activities where I was not in charge. We packed hygiene kits. We had an intergenerational group that I think was maybe the Edna S. Ward class, and either the youth group or a younger group. We had all kinds of different things, but there was this incredible alternation back and forth between the church activities where I was in a different role and packing and sorting. There was one dream where we were also buying a house and discovered that the sellers were going ahead and painting it for us, which was unexpected, but left us a loft full of stuff to sort. So this um, back and forthness of that and themes of bridges, bridges, bridges to be crossed from one church activity to another church activity. So I've just never had a deluge, literally, of a dozen dreams. And then when I went to Greenbow, I had three more in the same set of themes. Partners in listening. In the same sense that Eli and Samuel needed each other, I have found over the years that it's very important to have a few folks with whom to talk about what I think God is doing in my life and for whom I play that role, where others can share with me what they think God is saying to them. If you don't yet have someone who can do that, a Stephen minister, one of the staff, one of your Sunday school members, find someone with whom you can say, could we talk some? Because I think I'm getting some nudges from God. For me, some of those are family members. One is a dear seminary friend who's now an Episcopal priest and a spiritual director. She's kind of my prime uh, person to be able to uh, uh, think through these things with. And the person who's in charge and the main spiritual director at Greenbow. And so when I went there, I went armed with my notebook with all my dreams. <laughs> and she just laughed and she said, so you think God's inviting you to think about the next chapter? <laughs> I thought, yeah, probably so. So we did some scripture reflection and then she did something she'd never done before. Sent me outside to go pray with nature. And I got to see some of the trees that were, had lost all their leaves so that you could really see the outline of them. And yet there was this one homely little bridge across a really tiny little stream, and that bridge caught my attention. So then after I had shared about this, um, not too long after the, that, Jean Chef sent me some information, a wonderful reflection on a dream she'd had years ago before I got here, but in that season of transition, about a bridge and the necessity of crossing a bridge and we didn't, you only knew my name, but she had a very clear conviction in the dream, or a hunch perhaps we should say, that we needed a bridge for the next chapter, and that perhaps that would be my role. So it, it really was just this repetition and weaving together of these sorts of things. And the sense of companionship is very biblical. Paul and Ananias needed each other. Peter and Cornelius needed each other having someone with whom to share, what is God saying? What is God doing? One of the other things that is uh, a piece of discernment is, is, is the way forward becoming clearer. You know, it's, folks will sometimes use that image of the doors opening or the doors closing. And for me, that, that seemed to be happening uh, I, I got home from the evening of talking with the staff parish committee, and within 45 minutes to an hour, we got an email from our sellers that we're buying the house from that the tenant was moving out earlier. Did we want to go ahead and move the closing up earlier so we could start with the uh, painting and improvements that we probably wanted to do? And we had not expected to be able to start those things until sometime next spring. So all of a sudden, there was just this um, that, a door opening. So there are some criteria that, that I have found helpful over time. A colleague, Dick Wills, has some slightly different criteria when he's trying to discern if a, a nudge is from God. One is, does it involve a kingdom issue? 
Does it involve something that is near to the heart of God's purposes? Is it too big to do by yourself? Will it require other people being involved? And is it scary? That one's a little bit unnerving because sometimes we want the messages from God to only be the soothing and comforting ones and sometimes they're the scary ones because if we could simply do them by ourselves, there wouldn't be any room for God to be involved in them. And I thought about the processes that we have moved through over the last several years. Renovating and expanding spaces for worship and study, for communities and small groups and congregation to grow in love and service and fellowship. Well, that's a kingdom issue. Was it too big to do for any one or two of us, any small group? Oh, yeah. And was it scary? Oh, yeah. There are a couple of prayers that I think are always timely. The prayer about, Lord, what do you want to do through me is good at any season of life. It is not a confined to, oh, we're doing the capital campaign, we're going to pray that prayer again. It's always a good prayer. And it has a counterpart prayer, which is, Lord, what do you want to do in me? Lord, what do you want to do in me? Is there a wound that needs healing? Is there shame that needs forgiveness? Is there an untapped resource that needs stretching? To pray for, God, what do you want to do in me? And what do you want to do through me? Our good kingdom prayers. So we're going to have some time now to pray. You've got slips of paper again. These are going to be a part of that prayer focus on the Saturday, the 21st. And so we've got time and space to pray. There may be something that's already on your heart. When we were planning worship, we were still hearing about the shooting in Las Vegas. And so that just was a cloud. And then Johnny's wife also. A sense of heaviness and of the need to be able to bring those and lots of other concerns to God in prayer. If no particular name or face comes to mind, you could consider praying and write it out. Lord, what do you want to do in me? My hunch is God will give you a sense of what that might be. And you might pray, Lord, what do you want to do through me? And again, probably there will be a sense of what that might be. It is risky to pray. You may have seen the little uh, mm, plaque or slogan about prayer changes things. Someone had that in their home and another family member came in and removed it from its place, inspiring the first one to ask, so you don't believe in prayer? To which the reply was, well, of course I believe in prayer. I just don't really like change. So in order to, when you pray, there is always the risk that you'll hear a response. Sometimes you won't write then, but sometimes you will. So we will have some time now for prayer. We'll have some music that goes with it because for some of us, prayer is a way in which we, uh, singing is a way in which we pray and a, which, uh, a way in which God prays through us. So...